is there some chalk here? Is there some chalk? Okay, so uh, just to recap uh, briefly on what we, where we stand, what we did uh, yesterday. I hope you all uh, nicely recovered from yesterday's lecture. I heard it was uh, tough for some. Um, I'm glad that you still have decided to come today. Um, the, um, so, okay, a stochastic con control problem is the following. We have a dynamical system which is given to us. It uh, can be written as some sort of a, a stochastic differential equation where f is the dynamic, changes x incrementally in small time steps uh, over a course of time, and then there is noise added to this, uh, to this, uh, to this system. And uh, then we have a cost, which, is, uh, which is, uh, consists of, uh, of a pass term, and it consists of an, of an end term, and we want to minimize essentially this cost. So all these terms are given, we know everything, we just have to find the control u, which is a function of x and time, such that this expectation value gets minimized. So the mental picture that you should keep in mind is that, for instance, if you have that the, that the change that the dx of t is just uh, is just uh, is a, is a, just a, let me say just a, a u dt. Let's take the simplest case plus dwt, right? So then is f is just uh, u, and uh, suppose our cost is the expectation value of some uh, end cost phi uh, x, x t, which may be uh, uh, something that I want to be on the origin. So I at, at time t at the end time I want to be in the origin, and then I have a. a uh, integral of some, some path cost, which is this, this R, which can depend on the state and can depend on the control, but the simplest case, it will just depend on the control, maybe in this way, we get this, this thing. So if we want to, if we start here at an initial condition, we want at the end time, capital T, we want to be as close as possible to the, to the origin. And so we have to balance uh, two, two terms, it's this term and this term, if we steer very hard, we take a large control, get us really close to the, uh, to the origin, this term will be large and this term will be small. If we don't steer very much, uh, this term will be small and this term will be large because we will end up somewhere, somewhere over here. Right? So our optimum will be, uh, will be somewhere uh, in between. And so there is, there is uh, noise in the system, so the trajectory may take you somewhere here or it may take you likely somewhere there. And depending on where you end up at this time, your control will be uh, pointing some direction. And this optimal way to steer is this optimal control function u of x and t, which is the objective of the, the problem, the thing that you want to, to find out of, this, uh, out of this exercise, right? So that's the solution that, you, that you're looking for. Now, we have seen that, um, that the, the way to solve this is to introduce something which is the cost to go. And this is from any intermediate time and space and any intermediate time, t, say, we have a, we record a quantity j x t, which is, uh, which is the solution of the control problem from that intermediate time and that intermediate space to, to the end, right, for the same problem. We just uh, replace the zero by t, and then we solve this problem from this intermediate time towards the end, right? And, um, and this is a scalar thing, this is a number, uh, depending on space and time. And uh, this, no, this quantity satisfies a partial differential equation that we've seen, and this is Bellman equation. I started off yesterday in this lecture that this differential equation uh, can be viewed in, in discrete uh, time just as a, as a map uh, over time, and then we can take the time limit to zero and we get this partial differential equation. And this equation is given here on the bottom. This is this partial differential equation that it satisfies. It is the scalar value j. It is expressed in terms of the noise, in terms of the drift term, in terms of the, of the cost that you have, and the end cost that is given as a boundary condition on j. So we initialize j at the end time with j equal to phi. So we said j x t equal to phi of x. And then we run this partial differential equation backwards in time and get the solution for all times. Right, so that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the objective. And then when, when we have that solution, then the u at each time is given by the minimization of this right-hand side. So here you see a function which depends on, on x and t. And if we minimize it, uh, if we find a minimizer in, of this right-hand side uh, at, that, uh, at that point, then we, we find the optimal control at that particular point. Now, you have to appreciate that this is, of course, a very 
uh, difficult uh, exercise to do in general. So people do this, and in practice you can do this with, uh, for, for simple problems with up to maybe five, at most maybe ten dimensions to do this partial differential equation to do it by, by discretization of the space, discretization of time. And uh, so that's basically all you can do. Or you look at special classes of problems, and uh, in particular the linear quadratic control problems are, are easily solvable. So if the dynamics here is a, in this case, if this f is a linear function of x and t, x and u, and if the, con if the cost phi and uh, r terms are quadratic functions at most, then uh, everything's sort of uh, nice and you can get sufficient statistics, sort of like the Gaussian case of control where you can, can write the solution in terms of a bunch of, uh, uh, where the j becomes essentially a quadratic form, j becomes something like half x trans p x plus, uh, plus alpha transpose x plus uh, beta, so you can write it in this way and now the, all the time dependence of the j all the time dependence is now in this alpha, beta, and, uh, and p. And so, as always, this partial differential equation with this ansatz reduces to, a, uh, to ordinary uh, differential equations in terms of these p, alpha, and beta. And these, so since the x may be uh, some n-dimensional vector, p is an n-dimensional, n by n vector, so it still quite, can be quite a large thing, but it's uh, still quite manageable, uh, even up to thousands of dimensions. So you can do that thing. Yeah. Uh, what is the rational of uh, using this cost function in this particular way? This is an example. But can you use it, this cost function to be highly complicated and see if this method works? Or is it yeah, so here, as I see on the slide, so this r can be an arbitrary function of uh, x, u, and t. Mm -hmm. Arbitrary. No. So, 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 okay, as I said, so in general, you, so you can, for the general setting of this problem, you have to discretize space and time and run, make this, uh, this, this partial differential equation, uh, discretize it and, and use uh, uh, these uh, finite element methods to, uh, to solve this. And if you do that, it really doesn't matter how complex R is anymore. Yeah, numerically solving. Yeah, so analytically solving, no way, okay. no way, no way. So only, yeah, yeah. And in the case of in the case of linear quadratic, as I, I showed yesterday, you get a num you get a Riccati equations, which are s significantly simpler, but still cannot be solved uh, uh, analytically, uh, except in very special cases, as I gave an example yesterday. But in general, also not. But then it becomes at least tractable computational. Whereas, uh, of course, in, if you have to discretize the PDE, you get the curse of dimensionality that the number of grid points scales exponentially with the dimension of the, of the problem, right? So that's, that's the setting. Okay, so uh, to make advance, so we're now going to use, go to this class of path integral uh, problems where we can make uh, uh, some, some advance. And, and this is, here now the dynamics, we're going to uh, put in this way. So whereas before we had the dynamics which was a dx, which was f of x, u, t, dt, plus, uh, plus noise. We now split this as a function. We write it as a function of uh, x and t, dt, plus some other function, g of x and t, dt, times, uh, times uh, u of x and t, times u, say, u, uh, plus dw, plus, uh, and then this, this, this noise, we write it with the same function g. So we're going to write g x t d w t. So uh, that is to say, uh, we have uh, we split the, the u dependence that it depends linearly on the on the on the dynamics. So it's linear in the dynamics. The, the dynamics is linear in u, but it can be multiplied by some arbitrary function. Now this is maybe this may be uh, something in n dimensions, right? N dimensions, and this u may be something in m dimensions. And so this g is a, is a function which is, in, which, is a, which is n by uh, uh, n times m uh, matrix, right, uh, in general. So this is a matrix. So this is a n-dimensional vector. This is n times n matrix multiplying this vector. And the same holds for this. So we get, 
we can write this in this way that we have it over there, that we have the F and then G multiplying the, uh, the control and the noise. So that's one simplification that we make. The second simplification that we make is that we say in the cost function, this R, we make also a separation of the, the we, we peel out the, the cost dependent, the control dependent uh, part, here is U, we say that it's, it is this R which was before here, we now write as something which only depends on the state and on time, and something that is quadratic in the, uh, uh, in the control cost, U, in control U. And so, in a sense, so if you think about this system in the absence in the absence of a control, so if you put the control equal to zero, then this is an arbitrary dynamical system because this is uh, arbitrary, you can put any f here, uh, but the control acts on it in sort of a simplified way, right? It cannot act in any way like we had here in this way, but it ha has to act uh, additively and it also acts in the, it acts the same way on the dynamics as the, as the noise acts on the dynamics. So this is a particular uh, assumption that is that is made here. So um, if we put that that this dynamics now in the in the Bellman equation that uh, that I just showed you before, then of course we get that this this R term becomes now this term. This the whole cost term becomes this, and we get that this F becomes now S plus G times U. That is this this drift term that we had before, and the noise term becomes now uh, the, the 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 covariance of the noise we get uh, that, the, uh, that the variance of the, the, variance of, uh, the term G times DW is, uh, is something of the form uh, G nu G transpose, where nu is, uh, is, is, the, is the variance of, uh, of, uh, of DW, right? So we get... Uh, we get this, uh, this kind of uh, identity, so therefore we get this kind of uh, term, term uh, here. Okay, so then uh, this doesn't look like much yet at the moment, so we still have to solve it with the same boundary condition. Uh, so phi is still arbitrary, V is arbitrary. Uh, this is a matrix uh, in between these uh, m-dimensional uh, vectors. And now, uh, but now we have something which is quadratic in U and linear in U, and so we can do the minimization with respect to U. Yeah, question. First equation? There's a bracket. There's a bracket. It's a bracket. Yeah? Uh, and so now we can minimize with respect to, to u. So it's, very, it's quite easy. So we, we take the, the derivative of, uh, of this term. Let's see, uh, let's see how, we, how we are. So we have this, uh, we have, uh, what do we have? So let's we take, uh, so let's we take u transposed uh, r u. Uh, so what is the u dependence here? And we see uh, we get gradient, uh, gradient j transpose times, uh, times uh, g times u, and we have to take the derivative of this thing with respect to u, right? And so it gives us uh, r times u plus uh, a gradient uh, j times g is equal to zero, and so we find that the solution is given by the solution that u is minus r minus 1 gradient j transpose times uh, Times uh, times g, which is uh, uh, oh well, I get a get a reverse. Always I'm also confused with these. Uh, um, let me see. So we get basic. We get a. In fact, so this is a matrix times a vector, right? So this is a column vector, and so this is a. Uh, so j uh, is a is the gradient. This is so this the gradient is with respect to space, right? So the gradient of j is uh, is a uh, is an n-dimensional vector. Right, and this uh, this g is uh, is a uh, uh, n times uh, m, and so in fact we have to put here the, uh, the the transverse of this. So we have to take the transverse of this. So we get uh, uh, g transpose uh, gradient j here. So this is the this is the solution that we find for u, and so um, we can fill that back in into the uh, into the equation. So we we replace u. By, uh, by this term, 
And of course, then we get this very ugly expression over here, right? So the the uh, so we get. Let me let me do it. Uh, so we get, for instance, that the u transpose r u. We now fill in this thing. We get two minus signs, so we can skip that. So we get u transpose becomes uh, gradient j transpose g uh, r minus one, and then we get the r. And then we get r minus 1, and we get uh, g transpose uh, gradient j. And so this thing becomes uh, r minus 1. And that's this, this first term that we get over there. And then we have the, the, the so we have, let me just see. So we have the v term, that nothing happens. Then we get this gradient times f, then nothing happens. And then we have to compute uh, a gradient j g u term. So uh, uh, let me see. So gradient j, g, uh, u, and then we put in u here. So we get now this becomes minus uh, gradient j, uh, g, r minus 1, uh, g transpose, gradient j. Ha! Huh. So we see that essentially we get this term, we have it with a plus a half, so we get a plus a half here. And here, this term, we get the same expression, uh, but with a minus 1. So these two, they cancel. So if you add them, we get plus a half and minus 1. So I get here, uh, in this expression, I get here the uh, minus 1 half term, taking that. And then we're left with the rest of the terms that were untouched. The v, the, this term, this multiplying f, and this term all don't depend, uh, don't depend on u. OK, so now we got this very, uh, very ugly expression here. And now, um, now the trick happens. So if you, uh, so if we now define psi through this through this log transform. So in other words, we define we express j as minus lambda, which is a positive number, times the the log of uh, psi, and this is the definition of uh, psi in this way. And we fill this fill this in here. We uh, there is a. Uh, we get, if we take the, uh, then, um, let me see. So, okay, so this is the gradient. So you get the gradient of psi you get here, then a gradient, gradient of psi uh, square term. And here you get a second derivative of j. The second derivative of j gives you, let me just do it a, a, a bit sloppy. So if you take the gradient of, of j, it gives you minus lambda 1 over psi the gradient of psi, right? And if we take the second derivative of uh, the second derivative of j, we get minus lambda, and then we get two terms, right? We get we get minus one over psi squared, the 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 gradient of psi times the gradient of psi, and we get um, we get uh, a second term which is minus lambda one over psi, and then we get the second derivative of, of psi, right? So. If we make this, this substitution, then, then this, this, uh, this first term will give something which is quadratic in the gradient of psi. And this second term will give some, something that has two terms. One is quadratic in the gradient of psi, which is that one. And the other one is the second derivative of psi. Now, the first, this first term is proportional to r, it to, has r. And this, uh, this last term does not have, a, 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 as is quadratic in j. Now you can show that if you take this condition, that that uh, that this quadratic term that it cancels, and that means that the uh, that the only term that survives is this is this uh, is this diffusion term, this the second derivative term, right? And that is only true. Just a minute. Just only true if uh, if I choose this matrix R. So that's this first term. So I have to have a relation between this matrix R and this matrix nu. Uh, and it, it turns out that this, this cancellation occurs if these two matrices, that the inverse of this matrix uh, nu is proportional to this matrix R, or uh, with a proportionality, which is this lambda, exactly this, this number. So, yeah, there was a question. Uh, I'm trying to understand that equation, R u plus uh, uh, lambda, uh, j. Uh, can you explain that equation again? So you Here? Here? Shouldn't that J be before? 
Yeah, so it's actually, uh, uh, it's about vector, column vectors and row vectors. So, in fact, this is a matrix, this is a vector multiplying a matrix, right? Yeah, but that wouldn't give us a column vector, because our U is a column Yeah, so it has to be the other way around, yeah, but, uh, yeah, so it actually has to be the other way around, yeah, so it has to be G, this, uh, right? Is that, is that, uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. No, it has to be G transposed uh, this. Yeah, yeah, this is how it has to be. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. So if we make, it's a bit, so you can find it on the slide. So here the, the, the derivation is here in all the components uh, with the high dimensional thing. So you can go through it. It's not very enlightening, but uh, it's tedious and uh, you can do it. But the end of the, the end result is, is that this nonlinear term, that is nonlinear in J, can be made, can, can be made to cancel fallout if you have made this transformation and you, uh, you assume that, that this relation holds. And I'll come back to this relation in a minute, what that means. So that means that if you do this and you collect all the terms, every, all the terms will become linear in this psi. Right? So this is what happens then. So, okay, so if you do this, and, and I, I, don't, I'm not, it's, I don't think it's particularly enlightening to go through this whole derivation, but if you just do this and, and follow this and assume this, then what you will get is, is this hamilton jacobi belvin equation. That's what comes out. Now, this is still a partial differential equation. The, the min over u is gone, right? We, we're, we, we have solved for that. We have done the minimization over u. Uh, so the, the u is out of the problem now. It is still has, uh, it's, it's a high dimensional partial differential equation, but it's linear in, uh, in psi, so that's good news. Uh, and it has boundary conditions as we had before, so the boundary condition on J now translates on the boundary condition on Psi being, uh, being this term, right? So we get uh, this now. Okay, so uh, this, um, uh, so, okay, so now this equation that we get, the, which, is our, which is the linear Bellman equation, uh, so this is a linear, linear in the sense that it's linear in psi. So now we can interpret this, as I remind you of the lecture of yesterday, we had this Kolmogorov backward equation, and that also used the notion, the not, the notation psi, so the, I use the same notation for this, for this thing to highlight that. So we can now, actually, if we, if we think of a stochastic process which is given by a conditional probability to go from x at time small t to z at time uh, big t, if we identify uh, this with a psi and uh, with the dependence on the first uh, components, which was, uh, was the backward equation, then in fact this is a, a backward equation of a stochastic process and we identify, if I go back to the slides, we already saw this, saw this term, which was the drift term, and we saw this term, which was the diffusion term. There's a new term here, which we hadn't seen before, which is the multiplying actually psi, not with not, no gradient uh, terms there at all. So this is a new term. So what is this, this what actually what this term uh, uh, do, we will see, we can see that if we remember that, okay, let me, let me just give the answer. So the this process that this cor corresponds to is a process consisting of a drift and a diffusion, which is just this, this component, so the drift means that the stochastic process looks like this, the diffusion is like this, so it is in fact the same sorry for the different notation, it's the same as this process if I put u equal to zero, right? So we get this f and I get this g times w, that is the, uh, that's the process that you get. So that's, that is uh, these two parts of, the, of, the, of this equation. And apparently this runs in parallel with something which does minus v over lambda at, uh, at, each, at each time step. And this is a, a killing process. This is something that destroys probability. So, so far we have seen the process, this diffusion process conserves prob probability, the integral, so if we had this probability before of uh, um, uh, x comma t given x zero t zero, we had this probability distribution, this diffusion, right, we had uh, at initial time we had something starting here which is a very sharp distribution, then at later time it gets a broader distribution, but what we would have that if we integrate this over all x, then we will find that this is equal to 1, and this is true for all t, right? So this is always, uh, it's always normalized, right? There's always there's a Gaussian getting wider. Now, by introducing this, this extra term that we have here, this is killing probability. So it means that this is no longer true, right? Probability gets destroyed. 
or it creates it. And so the way to, to model that stochastically is that we run this, these two terms that we will give in this normal stochastic differential equation, we run it in parallel with a killing process. So at each time, we say that uh, we kill the particle. So if we do a diffusion, if we start with particles, at each moment of time, we, have a, we take an infinitesimal prob probability, v dt over lambda, to kill that particle. Right? And that is the process that is uh, being described here. And uh, the same at the, at the end time, the killing with the probability uh, psi over lambda. And so, uh, so this is, uh, so as, as we have seen before, we have this trinity of the this stochastic processes. We have the, partial, we have the stochastic differential equation, we have the Kolmogorov backward equation, and we have the focal planck forward equation. Also here, in the presence of this killing process, the same holds. So here we have the backward equation, here we have the stochastic description, and there is also a forward uh, description of it. And it's this kind of Fokker-Planck equation, which is the same as we had before, except there's now also this term here. Right? So if you, if, you want, if you worry about, uh, the, if you so want to understand this, the normalization issue, for instance, then if you, uh, if you look at the uh, integral of dx, of uh, d, d rho dt, uh, so that is the, if you integrate over all space uh, that, so you get now, uh, it is uh, the integral over dx of, uh, what do we have? We have minus v over lambda rho plus uh, rho on f uh, rho uh, plus one half trace uh, uh, lambda squared uh, g nu g prime uh, rho. Uh, yeah, rho. No, this way. Right? So we have this. So you see that, that these terms, uh, this term and this term, is a full derivative. Right? So if you integrate over all space, you will get boundary terms. And since these probabilities fall off at the boundaries, these terms, these integrals will give zero, right? But this thing is not a, is not a gradient, uh, it's not something. So this is actually not conserving probability. So this is meaning that the, that the, that the change in the volume of the probability is changing over time. Right? That's, that's why that's happening. Okay, so funny enough, we have now changed the direction of time, right? We get the, this Bellman equation we had to solve with end condition going backwards in time. And then we have identified it with the Kolmogorov backward equation, which corresponds to a stochastic process which runs forward in time, for which we have a Fokker-Planck equation description. So, okay, so we have changed the direction of time. We can go further. We can say that uh, there is a, there's, since, this, um, uh, since this equation is, is linear, in, w w there's, a, there's a famous theorem by, uh, by Feynman and Katz that to gives you the closed form solution in terms of a passive rule. And that is the following statement here. So suppose that, suppose that we now introduce a distribution over trajectories, which are the trajectories that are generated by this stochastic uh, process. Sorry for the clutter of notation. This d psi is the same as the dw we had before. Uh, and all these trajectories, they start at the same uh, state and at the same uh, time. And so we get, we get different runs, and the picture that you have is that you start here, you get these different uh, trajectories, and they are like that. And so you get a, so these are, each of them is a trajectory, and you get a distribution over trajectories, right? And this distribution over the trajectories you, you call Q, Q of, uh, of tau, tau is a trajectory. And um, so then, if this is the case, then you can show that if you define psi as the integral over all the trajectories under this, under this measure that you generated from this dynamics, and you weight each of these trajectories with e to the minus s of the tall, where that s is now the end cost plus this uh, state-dependent uh, uh, cost. So remember that the, we had a control problem set up uh, where we had three terms. We had the end cost and this term, and so this s is just this, this, these first two terms. It doesn't include this, this last term. So that is the, the S. So if you define uh, this function with S, these terms, you can show that, that Psi is a solution of this, uh, of this Bellman equation with the right boundary conditions. 
right? So that is the that's the big uh, big trick, and I'm going to show it. I'm not going to show it uh, why that is. It's a, it's a quite a quite a lengthy uh, derivation, but this is this is very very much a cornerstone of uh, of this uh, of this kind of this this idea here. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you so if you think of a diffusion, uh, you are um, you're uh, evolving a in terms of the Fokker-Planck equation, you're evolving a conserved quantity, right? Now, in this case, this is not a conserved quantity, and it, so it 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 means that. Uh, but so it, so normally, if the if there's no killing then if you start with n particles, then you have n particles at all time, right? If there is killing, you will lose particles, and you may run out of uh, particles at some point to do your, your statistics. So then you have to, um, then you have to actually uh, generate particles at intermediate time to... Uh, to, uh, to, to, to no, to add new particles in your statistics, because essentially there is a sort of... Um, okay, this is a... Okay, so this minus V... This V depends on the state, right? So in, in, this, in this state, for instance, the probability to get killed is much higher than in this state to get killed, right? So you get an imbalance of the, of the killing of the particles. But you could add a, a global constant to the V uh, or uh, subtract it, making, changing it to sign. So actually, this, and, and actually action, uh, changing this global constant doesn't change the physics at all. It doesn't change the property. doesn't change the control problem because if I change my original control problem, if I add a constant to here, which doesn't depend on the state, it doesn't do anything. But in this, in this killing formulation, you see that it's arbitrary. The sign of this is, in a sense, arbitrary. It's only about the relative uh, value of the, the value here and the value there. And that means that at each, at each time you start with 100 particles, at the first time step you kill, uh, say, 10%, you can generate another 10% to keep your total uh, value of particles, keep that, keep that constant. Uh, there, is, there are some tricks to do a regeneration of these uh, particles to keep the total number of particles the same. So that is, uh, yeah, that's the way you can do that, to simulate this, this killing process. No, essentially you have to. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Yeah, what you can do is that you, uh, yeah, you do something of, of uh, so you make an empirical distribution of your particles at this, at this time that you have, and then you, you generate uh, n particles as, from that empirical distribution. So you say, okay, I have, uh, I have on my state space, I have here a particle, and here a particle, and here a particle, the rest are all killed, and I'm going to uh, uh, generate particles uh, on, these, on these spaces with uniform probability. And so I, this, is, this is the way I generate new particles. I just make copies of it here, at the, part, at the, state, at the ones that you're there. And that is the way you, you replenish your, your set of particles. This is the way you do it. it it's the same that happens in particle filtering, uh, which is done in, in signal processing, this, this same the same thing, it's called resampling. Okay, so uh, uh, we get this. So, and this, the, this, this uh, gives us a solution. So we have to weigh each particle with uh, each trajectory with this, uh, with this factor. Um, okay, so that's that. So, okay, so this is one way to get to this path integral control. So now we see that we have the uh, optimal cost to go. We have it in an explicit uh, form. But I want to give you another way to derive this same, uh, this same result, and this is, the, is in the following way. So suppose that I'm in a discrete space, and I'm starting here, and I want to get here to the gold, or to the diamond in this case, and I want to avoid obstacles, and I, uh, uh, this is my problem, right? This is my control problem. I have some, 
uh, okay, so I have this as a setting. So I start in the initial state, and I can generate all kind of dynamics, right? I have the rules of the game, which is my, uh, which is my world. So the rules of the game in this case are that from this position I can move right, I can move right, and maybe diagonal also, but it will give me a high penalty, right? So there is some northeast, southwest kind of dynamics, which are the rules of the game that I can do. So from each state, I can go to a number of other states. And suppose that I make a, 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 a diffusion process which just imitates this, these rules of the game. So over another example, think of chess, right? They make the game of chess, there are the rules of the game, that means that the rook can make certain moves and, the, and, the, and the, the pawn can make certain moves, etc. And I can use random dynamics, random uh, futures of, uh, of, this, uh, of this game, and this gives me some, some trajectories. Um, and, and this is a diffusion process, and this diffusion process I denote by, by, this, by this Q, uh, which is the same Q that I, that I was talking about before. So these are, this is so-called the uncontrolled dynamics. This is the dynamics that I get if I just do random movements. It's the same that I got in this formulation here that I started with if I set the control equal to zero. That is the kind of dynamics that I get. I get just, just uh, brownie motions, right? I get that. Now, I, I can identify Q with the distribution that I get over these uncontrolled dynamics, right? Now, um, now I have a uh, now I set a cost which is consists of a, a path cost and an end cost which is I define. So for each trajectory I get a cost, and now I want to find a, a distribution over trajectories different from Q that minimizes this expected cost, right? This expected cost, and at the same time is close to my uncontrolled dynamics. So I have a, this kind of an objective, right? So this is a distribution, it's sort of a Gaussian shape, and I want to, to move that Gaussian shape a little bit, not too much, but in order, in the direction that it, that it gets a good expectation value of, uh, of, uh, of, of this uh, S. Now, for instance, if the S is only end cost here at this point, it only favors uh, positions here, then you see that the red trajectories will be the trajectories that, uh, that have uh, a low uh, expectation value of S, and, and then there is the other penalty that you want it to be sort of close to, to Q. So the, the way to formalize that is that you say, okay, I'm going to make a cost which is a function of a distribution, right? I'm optimizing this distribution over trajectories, P of tall, and I, I minimize two terms. One is the expected S, and the other one is the KL divergence. This is the distance between P and Q, right? Where the KL divergence is the the p log p over q, and where the, the stochastic variable is the trajectory uh, itself, right? So we have sum of all trajectories. Uh, this is this uh, KL divergence. Now, in, in, this, in this formulation, the, the optimization of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of p is actually very, very easy. It's so easy that I'm going to do it for you here on the board. So I just, uh, I just have uh, the, the c is the integral over d tau of p of tau log uh, uh, p of tau divided by q of tau plus uh, the integral, so we get uh, p of tau times uh, s of tau, right? So this is our whole cost function that we have to optimize, right? This is the expectation over s, the sum over the integral, so there's a, this here. So if I knew, now do dc dp of tau, I can very easily do that. It gives uh, this first term, it gives me the log of p of tau over q of tau uh, plus, and then I get uh, p of tau times the derivative of this thing, which gives me just a 1 over p of tau, and then I get the derivative of this thing, which gives me the s of tau. Ah, there's one thing I have not told you. Of course, I have to do this optimization under the constraint that, uh, that this distribution is normalized, right? So I have, a, I have a normalization constraint that the integral of all tau of p of tau is equal to 1, right? So this is a normalization condition. So I have an extra Lagrange multiplier here, plus lambda integral dt uh, p of tau uh, minus 1, right? This is my Lagrange multiplier. And so if I did take the derivative that also there, I get an additional term lambda here. So I, I get this, and I have to put that equal to zero to solve for the solution. And it's very easy to see that, uh, that this gives just a constant, that you get the solution that p of, um, p of t is, is, uh, is proportional to, uh, to q of t e to the minus s of t. 
right? This is the solution that you get here out of if you solve this, uh, solve this equation. And so the, the proportionality is solved by the normalization condition, right? And what is the normalization condition? So we get the normalization that the integral over Q of t uh, e to the minus s of t is, is, uh, is a normalization. Ha, but that thing we already seen because we know that that's uh, psi, right? We saw, uh, remember that we, we saw that, so it's here on the slide, right? It's, it's, it's psi that we defined in the feynman katz uh, formula. So this is psi, this is actually psi, it's a constant. So just to, rem just to remind me that I say p of, p of tau, it actually depends on the initial condition, right? X and uh, T zero, say. And so all these quantities depend on that. And, and therefore also this thing depends here, this psi depends on the initial condition, X zero and uh, T zero, X and T zero. Because, uh, because these trajectories depend on X and T zero. And also this, well, this cost maybe not. So there's this, uh, there's this relation, and so uh, we find uh, the solution that is of uh, this form here, that I wrote it down here, and, and this is this, uh, normaliz the normalization constant, is in fact uh, what we previously identified as the optimal cost to go, because there, this psi is actually the solution of the feynman katz uh, formula that we saw, right? And uh, it is related to, we have the relation that is uh, the J of uh, the cost to go, is minus lambda log of, uh, of psi x, psi xt, right? So we have, uh, we have this, uh, this relation. So we see very easily that, ah, again, so if we now take this, uh, this optimal solution, and we put it into the cost, uh, then, uh, then it's very easy to see that, uh, that some terms, uh, can, well, yeah, I'm not going to do it, but if you put it in, what you find is that the optimal cost is actually minus the log of psi, right? So, and that's exactly the same statement as, as this statement here. It's the optimal cost to go is minus the log of psi. And I've put a lambda equal to one in this derivation uh, here, right? Ah, I should tell you something about this, uh, this relation. So, uh, that, uh, let me do that now. So, there, is, there was a relation that lambda has to be equal to R times, uh, times nu. So that is to say R is a matrix that happened in the cost, right? We had one half U transposed R U. This is a matrix uh, in there in the cost, has uh, some terms. And the nu was happening in the, uh, in the, in the covariance of the noise. DW uh, squared is, uh, is nu DT. So this DW, let's say it's a matrix. Let's put it like this, DWI DWJ. Uh, is uh, nu ij dt, that's the covariance in the noise in the stochastic process. So these are completely unrelated, but in this path integral formalism, they have to be related in such a way that, that, uh, that, the, that one is proportional to the inverse of the other, right? So this is, uh, this is what you find, uh, find there. So what does that mean? So suppose that you have a two-dimensional system and, uh, and r is, uh, is diagonal, so r1, R2, and we have noise nu, this is R, and we have the noise is equal nu 1, 1, nu 1, uh, nu 2, with the zeros here, so we have uh, this kind of thing. So you see that, um, that this condition now means that you get uh, that lambda is equal to uh, uh, R1 nu 1, uh, R2 nu 2, uh, 0, 0. And so, basically, this, it means that, uh, that, uh, that this, and this left-hand side is lambda, is, is a uh, identity matrix, like lambda, lambda. So we need that, um, we need that uh, lambda is equal to R1 nu 1 is equal to R2 nu 2, right? So we can only do that if we, so if we have this, uh, this relation between these variables. So that means that if, um, if the noise uh, in a certain direction is zero, uh, it means that the, uh, uh, so, okay, so if we, uh, let, me, let me see how we do this. Um, uh, so we can take, uh, so we take Ri is, is, um, is the, is new I, uh, divided by lambda, right? So this is a solution that, that we can take. 
And so we see that, uh, uh, no, sorry, Ri is uh, lambda divided by nu i. So, it, so if we keep lambda fixed, we see that if we make the noise in one direction, if we make it zero, right, the covariance of the noise in one direction, this covariance of this noise process, make it zero, it, it means that in that direction, the control uh, penalty goes to infinity, and that means that the control value, the solution that we get, goes to zero, because it gets infinitely penalized, right? So in the directions where, so if i is a direction where nu i goes to zero, it means that r i goes to infinity, and it means that u i in that direction goes to zero, right? So it means that directions where there is no control, uh, there is no cost, there can also be no control, right? So that's a limitation of this path integral uh, formalism, that there, is a, that there is sort of a balance between, uh, between directions that are noisy and, and to the extent that they are being controlled, with the, with the extreme that if there is no noise in a certain direction, that direction can also not be controlled. So for instance, as a, as a particular example, so if I take a, uh, if I were to take a second order system, right, I say, uh, if I take uh, x or z, z double dot is u, as we had before with this, uh, with this uh, spring, uh, control spring system, and we make it in two variables where we say z is x1 and x2 is, uh, is z dot, right, we would get a system here x1 dot is uh, x2 and x2 dot is, uh, is u, right, so we would get this uh, kind of system. Now, from this, uh, from the philosophy that we develop here, we see that if we want to make this in a stochastic system within the path integral from framework, we can add noise here. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, you uh, dt, um, and and but we cannot add noise here, right? Because we cannot add uh, we cannot add noise here because uh, then we also would have to add control there, right? So. Um, so that is that is so. This is a, this is a particular uh, limitation of this path integral control case. So another example is, for instance, if I have two uh, Brownian particles, uh, then if I have d uh, d x one is uh, u one uh, d t plus d w one, and I have d x two is u two uh, x t. Uh, with no noise, um, let me see whether I do this correct. Uh, no, suppose that I have uh, one particle which is uh, which is uh, which is not under my control, right? Uh, so I have this just brown emotion, and the other particle has a control and has noise. Then. Um, then actually I cannot, uh, this is not a particular example of the path rule case because I cannot, I have, uh, I have no control over this noisy direction. Right? So I have to, this is, this is outside of the, of the path rule control class. Okay, any questions there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm saying that I'm, I'm, so this is a deterministic system, there's no noise. Yeah, exactly. So if I now want to make it in a stochastic system, I can add noise here, but I cannot add noise here. Why not? Because I have no control here. But, but, I mean, it would be a kind of underdone I mean, I could, it's a version of, uh, I don't know. I mean, I can have, for instance, a Rolfstein Lambert process where I put a forcing on the velocity, but I It is. So I, I don't understand the comment. Remote control you can, yes? Remote control is equal noise. So if you have this, so you cannot write this in the form that I started off with, in this form. So you have to have, so you have to have it in a, in a vector form that, that you have it in this. Right, so, so adding this noise would mean that I also have to have a control, which I don't have. Okay. So they go hand in hand. Okay. 
that's that's the point. Yeah, it was in the first version that it didn't agree. So okay. it's it not, if there's no noise there, it leaves So this is fine. This is fine. Uh, yeah, okay. This is fine. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So this you can do. This is path control control, but you cannot add the noise here. Okay. That's that's the point. Yeah. So I will I will show now that in the uh, in the case maybe you're referring to that. Uh, so in the case uh, so this 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 story is quite general, and and you see that the cost is now consisting of two terms, which is this term and this term, and previously. The cost consists uh, also of this term, which we had, which was the phi and the v, and this one we had the u squared term, yeah. and and you can the integral of u squared term, and you can show that if if you now go to the special case where uh, where these control diffusions are given by this stochastic differential equation, that in fact p corresponds to trajectories over over uh, over this diffusion process, and q corresponds to trajectories over this diffusion process with u equal to zero. And if you then, for these particular p's and q's, compute the KL divergence, it will turn out to be this term. So it will actually recover this u squared uh, term that we had before. So it's all the same. And this condition of lambda, uh, this condition, is automatic that you get this nu minus one as the, as the value of r. Sorry? The KL formulation yeah. will also be valid for other forms of control, not just for getting. So, so quadratic in U, right? Yeah. So, but it can be arbitrary function of the state, and the dynamics can be arbitrary nonlinear. Yes. It's just quadratic in U. Yes. Yeah? Yes. That's your question? No, so if in the case that you have this, uh, this Brownian, uh, Brownian noise case, it re the KL formulation reduces to a term quadratic in U. If you have other noise processes, the corresponding uh, control term will not be quadratic in U, will be something else. So if, you're, if you apply this, this formalism to, uh, to, a dynam to stochastic dynamics, which have not Gaussian noise, but have some other kind of, you know, say a discrete state space with some sort of uh, Poisson noise, then uh, if you apply this formalism, it would imply, this KL cost would imply a particular other term here. That's, is that your question? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, uh, so this is, uh, so now we have the optimal cost to go. We can uh, we can get it as the log of this uh, psi, and the psi was given as a uh, integral uh, like this, and it can be sampled, right? So we can sample uh, trajectories under under Q, which is this uncontrolled dynamics, which is the dynamics in the absence of U. So we generate trajectories. We weight all these trajectories with e to the minus s, and then uh, we get uh, some estimate, and which gives us an estimate of the optimal cost to go, and we have solved our control problem without ever solving the Bellman equation. So we can solve the control problem as a sampling problem. And that's good news because sampling scales typically better in high dimensions than doing uh, some sort of uh, finite uh, element uh, scheme. Right? So this is good. OK, so we, here with this, we can get the optimal cost to go. You can actually also compute the optimal control. And it's, 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 I will not derive it, but it's given by this, by, uh, by this formula, which is well, it's, it's, really, it's given by the fact that U is in fact, um, okay, I can give a little bit of a hint on that. So U was given as the gradient of J, right? And J was a log of Psi. Now think of Psi as a partition sum. Then the log of Psi is like a free energy, and you take the derivative of the log of uh, free energy with respect to something, in this case with the, the coordinates, 
And what, what you get out is some expectation values. And it turns out what you get out is this formula. It's too, it's too involved to get into it. But what you get out is this formula that you say that the optimal control at, at a certain point is given by this expectation value, where dw is the first, uh, is the first step of your noise. So, so you have a noisy trajectory. Um, let me do it here. So we have a noisy trajectory. Um, suppose that, um, that I have this problem. I start here, and I want to go to the origin at the end time. I, I make a, a trajectory which, uh, which is, goes uh, like this, and it ends up here. And I make another trajectory which uh, does this, and it goes up like there. Now, the expected value of the first noise component, the first dw term, right? the expected value of that, is, of course, zero, because it is just a mean Gaussian uh, zero. But if you weigh uh, this, this term with the total path that it generates, right, then it gets somewhere. And if you go first into, the, uh, into a little bit into the right direction, you have a slightly hard, larger chance to get to the goal than if your first step would be into, uh, into the wrong direction. Right? And so, um, uh, so, these, so if, you, if you weigh... You, if you do the, the if you weigh this this w with the with the cost of the whole with the cost of the whole trajectory, then the trajectories that go into the right direction get weighted higher than the trajectories that go into the wrong directory uh, wrong direction. So this 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 expectation value will then be no longer zero. And the miraculous thing is that that actually the value that you get out is exactly the optimal control. So that is the miraculous thing. So we suppose, so I start in here, there's a pot of gold there, there's nothing there. I do random samples, some go to, into that direction and will end up with a pot of gold. Some go that direction, they end up nothing. My trajectory is, my, my, my first step is weighted by the, by the final cost. And the, the ones that point that way get slightly more, uh, more weighted. Therefore, my mean gets slightly in that direction. And the statement is that that, that that bias that I compute is in fact the optimal control in that point. So you can sample a solution for the optimal control as well as the opt optimal cost to go. Yeah, there's a question. Then you change? Yeah. Which would be, however, an sort of policy algorithm that says that you're sampling your future according to the, to, to the uncontrolled dynamics. Yeah. So is, there, is there a way of doing something more online in the sense that... I will get to that. So the rest of the talk will be much about that. So I tell you that... Uh, uh, okay, so here's a recap. So... Um, so suppose I want to compute, I have this dynamical system, so this is sort of a, a simplified uh, slide, but suppose I want to go to the ori from the origin to either one of these two, two uh, goals, and this is my dynamical system that I have, and I have this, uh, this cost uh, that I want to minimize. So if I don't, I'm not in the path to the goal class, what I typically do is that for this case, I solve the, uh, the Bellman equation, which is a partial difference equation, and the solution would look something like this. Right, so this is time, and this is space, and color, it means the height of the, of the, of the J, and J is very low here because here I'm on the target, and it's very high, very high here because I'm very far away from the target. Right, so this is the solution of J of this partial differential equation, and then a solution of, uh, of your trajectory would look something like this, because you have a noise in this thing which is not under control, the only thing the control is in here, but you can compute the optimal control in the solution, and the trajectories would be very noisy, but they would get more or less uh, to the goal, right? This is the kind of picture that you would then have. And so uh, this is what we've been talking about, and so this is the, st the standard way. Now, the path integral way is that you say, okay, I, I'm considering functions uh, where, uh, where they, they have this split in, uh, in the state-dependent and uh, linear in the control-dependent part, and then uh, my cost is also split in, uh, in this way, and I get this S, and then there is this quadratic term, and we've seen before that this quadratic term is actually the KL divergence that we've seen between these things, and therefore we get this, uh, this, this identity with this KL formulation. And if we do that, 
then we can solve that uh, and we get a solution that I just pointed out to you that was, was this solution, right? We get a P star which is proportional to Q uh, and the weighted trajectories. So we get two types of trajectories. Here is optimal trajectories that are all weighted equally because I, have, uh, I, I just have the optimal control computed and I start a trajectory and I, 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 point, I paint a trajectory and these are all optimal and I get a distribution over trajectories which are the distributions over optimally controlled trajectories. Those are these, right? Now this, here, I get, I get grayscale trajectories because here I get trajectories generated from the uncontrolled dynamics so they're all over the place, that's where this gray area is but they're weighted with e to the minus s, right? And this e to the minus s is picking out the, 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 the ones that are, uh, so it's colored here with e to the minus s, and so you see that some of these trajectories are weighted uh, high and some of them are weighted low. And the miraculous statement is, is that these two trajectories are the same. These two distributions are the same in, in the probabilistic sense, right? So this, these unweighted trajectories from the optimal control give the same cloud of trajectories, same distribution, as the weighted trajectories uh, under, the, under the naive control uh, weighted by this factor. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the, the essence of, of this pathological control method. And this is known in the math literature as the Girzanov uh, theorem. Okay, so we can, uh, we can compute it by sampling. So now, uh, so let me give you an example. So here's, uh, so here's the same example, and now I'm going to uh, look at the solution for different values of j. I already showed it to you, it was this uh, thing, but I can take th different cuts at different times through here. And what you see is actually that is the following, is that there is a, that there is a, that for large time, for long in the past, it's the convex, uh, convex uh, shape. And so it means that since the control is the gradient of J, you're steering towards the middle, right? And then at some rate point, you get this, this, this uh, symmetry breaking, you get this tilt over, and you get these two wells, and, and then uh, actually you have to make a choice, right? If you're in the middle, you're right on the middle, you have to either fall to the left or fall to the right. And so decision-making, in a sense, which of the two targets to go to, is, is here a dynamic process, where early in time you say, well, I'm, I'm going to delay my decision, I'm not going to do anything, just going to steer in the middle. And uh, at some point, of course, this is no longer good enough at the end, because then you would end up in the middle, you won't, don't want to end up in the middle. So at some point you have to make a decision for left or right, but there is, it's not optimal, actually, to make that decision as early as possible. And that is sort of a curious uh, fact, so and this is known as, as delayed choice. So you, you start here at the origin, and instead of saying, well, oh, okay, my first step gets me slightly up, so I will going to go to this target. Instead of doing that, you're going to say, well, let, hold on, just stay in the middle, let's see what happens. Let's see where the drift takes me. If the drift takes me to, to the top, fine, I'm going to go there. But if it takes me to the bottom, I'm going to go there, and I have time enough to decide that, I don't have to decide now, I don't have to spend control effort to steer ma magically to go somewhere because future noise may destroy whatever I have controlled uh, already. And so another way to look at this is that, that you say, okay, there is a, there's these two, two targets, I have here two targets here, and I want to steer, uh, uh, I want to steer to one of them. Now if I'm here and my noise cone uh, my, my, the, the, the expected the width of this diffusion process, this, this width of this thing, is wide enough to encompass both things, there's likely that I'm going to get to one of these two, right? So if, this is, if my noise cone is wider, then the distance of these two is fine. But if I move closer, right, this is going to get in between that, and then I have to make a decision. So that's, in a sense, uh, the process that happens. And so you see that uh, if the noise cone is very narrow, you will have to make the decision very early in time, and if, uh, the wider the noise cone is, the later you can make the decision. That is to say, the larger the noise in your problem, the more you can delay your decision, right? If you have a very deterministic problem, you have to make your decision very early in time, and the more noise you add, the later you can make the decision. And I always make the joke at this point that uh, this, is, this reminds me of uh, Christianity in, uh, in Europe, where we have actually two solutions. We have the high temperature solution in the south, and we have the low temperature uh, solution in the north. In the, in the south we have uh, Catholics, and the north we have uh, Protestants. And, the, uh, and both of them act uh, uh, optimally, and so in the, the high temperature, the low temperature solution is where I'm from. I'm from the north, and my, my, my parents were Protestant, and they, my mother always told me, 
uh, don't leave for tomorrow what you can do today, right? And that is the uh, low temperature, uh, low noise control solution. Do it as early as possible, right? And of course, you know the southerners, they have another approach to this, particularly in Spain, they have the famous saying, uh, mañana, well, we'll do it uh, another day. So they have a high temperature solution, which is, uh, which is to delay the choice uh, more because they have more noise in their system, as to say. So this is uh, how, this, uh, how this works out in real life. Okay. Uh, and you also see it here in, in, in football. So, uh, so here you see this also a wonderful uh, example of, uh, of delayed choice. So very sophisticated football players, they can make a planning a large in the time in the future and they know that they appreciate that the problem is uncertain so the ball can go anywhere. So they spread out themselves over the field. But if you take a look at, uh, at the... Uh, so the beginners, of course, they all know where the ball, they're all like on top of the ball, so they don't, they don't delay any choice, they just uh, go right for the, for the thing. So they haven't had these... Huh? Is, is that in simulations, is, is the control quadratic? In this picture? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> in this one, yes. In this case, the cost is... Uh, yeah, this simulation is actually the same as... Uh, as, as this, and uh, V is zero, and phi is just these two endpoints. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And can you find this optimal time when to decide? Uh, yeah, so in fact, uh, yeah, so the, the time is, uh, the optimal time is in fact in this problem, it's, it's one of the noise. Oh, uh, the, so the, um, it, it was somewhere on the slide, I think. Yeah, the, uh, so the time to go uh, is, is, is two minus T in this case, this is the time to go, and the, the decision is made at a time which is uh, uh, one over the noise. So at the time to go, the time to go is one over the noise. Right? So if the noise goes to infinity, the time to go, uh, the, the, the t, this capital T goes to, to zero, actually, you will make the decision at the end. Right? And if, this, if the noise goes to zero, this goes to infinity, the time to go is, becomes infinite, so it's infinite in the past. It means that uh, I'm starting here, so that if you start at a, a time zero and you only have two, then it depends on whether this, 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 this time, this two, is larger or smaller than one of the noise, if it is, right? So this, yeah. Okay, uh, these are some details. Uh, okay, this is uh, a video of, uh, of, uh, of doing this, this control on... Uh, on the number of uh, uh, drones. So the, the problem here is that I have uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of drones, about 10, and they fly here around. This is a realistic uh, simulator and, uh, where, we, where there is noise and there is turbulence and uh, there is a no noisy uh, GPS signal that you can get uh, the position of these, uh, of these drones. And, uh, and so uh, the task here is that they have to stay close to the central pole and they have to maintain a minimal velocity and they have to not bump into each other and for the rest uh, they can do whatever they want. And, and so the way that this is modeled is that there is a model which is basically model each of the drones as a point mass and, uh, and uh, so the model is updated several times per second in which the positions of the drones are, are, are recorded. So it's a centralized control solution in this case. Where uh, uh, and then the uh, then you have a model where all the positions of the drones are and the, and the velocities and then there is a, this path integral simulation is done in the future uh, about 10,000 uh, trajectories and then from that the optimal control is is computed for all the 10,000 uh, for all the uh, 10 drones and that is that these controls are then sent to uh, to the drones and, and they, they update their uh, position uh, and their velocity uh, with that, and that is then repeated about three times uh, per second, and this is the movie that you, that you, uh, that you see. So uh, here you, uh, you see that they, uh, they fly around, and they get at some point, they get uh, uh, into, the, into a, uh, a configuration where they, they form this pattern. In this case, they form this circular uh, uh, pattern after after some time. So the pattern that they form asymptotically depends 
uh, very much on the uh, amount of noise that you put into the problem and also on the amount of, uh, of uh, drones. You can also get solutions with two concentric circles, uh, but in this case you find, uh, find this one uh, concentric uh, one circle. So, uh, so this is the, the pattern that's being, being established. The second uh, simulation is a cat and mouse scenario where there is four drones are, are cats and one drone is a mouse. And the only thing that the, that the mouse wants to do is to get away from the cats. So it always computes uh, direction away from the, from the cats. And the four, the four cats are under control in the same way. And their task is now to, to catch the, 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 the mouse. And that you see that they, uh, they, they do this uh, quite well. And so they have, uh, of course, in, this, in, this, in order to do that, they have to coordinate uh, their actions, right? Because if one goes to the left, the other goes to the right, they have to catch together. And they compute this coordinated task over a future horizon, and in this case, this is a future horizon of, of two seconds, so, so they really have to plan ahead to see what happens in order to get a successful strategy. Now, if we remove the horizon time to one second, it illustrates that these cats become uh, sufficiently short-sighted and actually stupid that they don't think uh, well enough ahead that they're actually the control fails, and, and they, they, they are not. So it's really needed to have this sort of planning in the future in order to get this coordinated behavior uh, uh, out of this. So what is the mouse doing instead? So it's just, uh, the mouse is just trying to get away from the cat. So it, it computes a resultant from, uh, from, uh, from each of the cats, so the repulsive force from each of the cats, and trying to get away from that. But it's just, uh, I don't know, it just has a reactive strategy, or is also uh, planning? No, it's not planning. It's not planning. No planning. It's just, it's just trying to get away from the cats. So it just has a stupid strategy, which is trying to get away. There's no planning in the mouse. Okay. So I also thought about like putting like two different kind of objective function for, for like cat, cat and mouse. Mouse. Yeah, so that's not here. No, no, this is just a collaborative control. You could of course do that. Okay, so um, we're also, this is a, some Chinese collaboration that actually did this uh, in, in, uh, with real drones, so they got it, uh, got it to work, but they never got it to really to publish it, so uh, I have to rely on this picture already, so I'm <laughs> not sure about that. Okay, so uh, the last part of the talk, which, uh, which I want to talk to you about important sampling. So I told you that it is miraculously that I sample this path integral, and then I get the estimate of the control. But of course, the story is much more complex than that. Right, because, uh, so suppose that I want to go uh, in this control situation, I want to go from the origin, I want to go through one of these holes and then go uh, maybe back to the origin again. So if I do the naive uncontrolled dynamics, I sample all the trajectories, they all end up into the wall, they all get cost, uh, since the wall has a cost infinite, e to the minus infinite will give a weight zero to these trajectories, so they're all basically absent, and only these three trajectories are, is, is what I have to do, base my statistics on. So I get very, very poor statistics, right? And so it would be much nicer if, if I could sample something like this, but of course then I'm sampling in the wrong direction, that is not my uncontrolled dynamics, so then I'm doing something wrong. But the, what the thing, what you can do is something called uh, uh, important sampling. And the important sampling, um, I, is, is for those who don't know, so suppose that you have a Gaussian distribution here and you want to sample, the, estimate the probability that x is less than zero, right? So the naive thing that you would do is that you say I sample from my Gaussian distribution and I count the number of times that I get an x that is less than zero and I, I take a fraction of that and that's this, uh, this fraction that I get over here and that is my estimate of the probability that x is less than zero, right? It's, it's unbiased, it's a correct, but it's not particularly efficient because all the x's that are larger than zero I have to discard because I just give zeros in my, in my estimate. I don't count anything. So could I do better? Yes, of course I can do better, which is called important sampling. So I put a distribution which is a little bit more mass on the left, I can, can do better. So instead of sampling from the blue distribution, I could sample from the green distribution, say, and then, um, and then writing the probability that x is less than zero, I can write it by multiplying and dividing by p, which is my green distribution. And now I can sample uh, from p and consider this the function that I want to evaluate. Right? So I sample, so the, the import, generate samples from P and now compute the statistics of, for each of these points of this, this ratio and, uh, and the, it has a correct expectation value and it has a variance uh, which, uh, well, no, 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 let's not care, don't worry about that. So you can ask yourself, what is the optimal distribution to sample from? So what is, do you have any ideas? Who would know what is the optimal distribution in this case? So some distributions are better than others. Clearly, 
Gaussian. Which Gaussian? I have here two Gaussians already. Would it be a Gaussian setting uh, uh, with the mean at the intersection point? This is a, this is a Gaussian with the mean at the intersection point, right? Broader Gaussian. Any other ideas? Must have an infinite support. It's not, not zero anyway. Right. Well, it turns out, uh, no, the, the correct answer is not there yet. Huh? Bimodal. Bimodal. Why we don't have the two modes? Where do you want to have the two? OK, these answers are all incorrect. So this is the optimal distribution. The optimal distribution is actually, if you look at your original problem, it is, it is the integrand of the thing that you want to solve. So this product is you take as a distribution and you normalize it. That's the optimal distribution. So if you take this product, so it is, it is your, uh, your Gaussian multiplied by your objective function. So in this case, the objective function is 0 here and 1 here. So you get, in fact, only this shape. And this shape, you have to now renormalize to, uh, uh, to be norm 1, right, to total norm 1. So in other words, you just get q times i, this indicator function, divided by the normalization. But the normalization was a quantity a that we wanted to start to compute, well, that we wanted to compute, right? So we don't know a, so we don't know this distribution, right? But this is the optimal distribution. So if you, why is it optimal? Well, if you take this distribution and you put it into this, uh, into this formula here, then, uh, then if you pay, replace p star here, this p star, by uh, qi over a, you see that, uh, that, the, the one, that it becomes a, and that the qi, they cancel. So you see that, right? Do you see that? So if I, have, if I put p star qi over a, if I put that in here, I see that for each sample xi, I get the qi get canceled, and I get, a, I get, in fact, a. So for each of the samples, I get the correct answer. So I'm sampling from a distribution, from this distribution, and I get all kinds of different x's. I get different x's, but every time the estimate that I make is always the same thing, which is a. So I only have to sample once, because if I repeat, I get the same number. There's no need to do it twice, right? So with one sample, I get the optimal solution, and I have no variance. I always get the same solution. So that's why it's optimal. But of course, it's unrealistic because it requires a notion of A, which is a normalization, which I don't know, which is the thing I started out to, to compute with. But this is the optimal, uh, optimal important sampling. So um, the same holds for the, for the uh, path and goal trajectory. So here we have the same problem, and I draw trajectories from the uncontrolled dynamics, which is just a normal diffusion, and I weight it with e to the minus s, the, the trajectories, and I get an estimate of, of psi, which is just this, uh, this average, right? Which is now, which is the, uh, our estimate of the path integral. So we had psi was the integral over all trajectories of q of tau uh, e to the minus s of tau. And what we're now computing here is a sample estimate of that, where we sample trajectories. We replace this by, we say that this is roughly uh, 1 over n by the sum over uh, the trajectories. We, traje we sample from this, and we get e to the minus s tall i, right? This is the, the, the trajectory. And these are just these, these weights that we add up here. So that's this term. And we can, so now these, uh, we can talk about the sample efficiency. So some samples will have a large weight, and some samples will have a short, have a low weight. And it's the variance of these weights that will, eff will, will affect, will define our, our estimate, uh, our uh, efficiency. So if the variance of these weights is very large, the, the sampler is very, very, very bad. Uh, if, the if, the ever, if, the, if the variance is very small, it's a very, very good sampler. And this, here you see an example of that that we started off with. Here, for instance, most of the weights have, uh, are zero and some are non-zero. So you get actually a quite a very large variance in the, in the, in the, in, in the, in the weights. Uh, and that is, uh, that's the reason why this is a very bad sampler. So you want to have a sampling procedure such that your weights are as equal as possible, so that, you, that your sampling is uniform as possible, and this gives you the best one. And this optimal sampler that I had here actually does that because it, in each time it computes the same number, so you get a variance of zero. So we can define the variance uh, uh, of this way, so we can just uh, define it, and we can introduce something called the effective sample size, which is the 
how many effective samples I have out of n samples that I use for the sampling. So I start with 1,000 samples, and in this previous example, only three are left. Right? The effective sample size is three, then. And so I can relate that in general in this way. And if the variance is large, the effective sample size is, is small. Right? So in this case, the effective sample size is, uh, is 1.8. Uh, I have uh, here, uh, uh, I think, 10, uh, 10 trajectories. And you, they're color-coded, but you don't see them because their color is, is, is almost white. So these are the only two out of 10 that, uh, that survive. If I, now take, if I now take another kind of uh, controller, so if I, now, if I now take another distribution, P of t, which is now uh, generated by diffusions, which already take a little bit of the intelligence into account. I take now, uh, so I know in this case the optimal control. I could generate trajectories with the optimal control, and that would be a very good way to generate samples. And, and here intermediate, I take half the optimal control. I take the optimal control solution as, as a function of x and t and divide it by 2 as to get a suboptimal uh, controller. And you get, the, in this case, with the 10 trajectories, you get effectively, you get a three and a half uh, trajectory. And uh, if you sample with the optimal control, then you get uh, effective sample size very, very high. So you see here that there is sort of a bootstrapping procedure that if you have a bad, bad, uh, bad controller, which correspond to a bad uh, important sampler. So here, what I didn't say, what I should say, is that so this idea of important sampling is now done by, the by changing the control, right? So we have a uh, diffusion process, which is uh, naively generating from the uncontrolled dynamics, but now we're going to make uh, uh, important sampling by actually generating uh, trajectories with a certain control. And uh, by changing that control, we can make more and more effective uh, uh, important sampling strategies. And uh, the, so, and, and naively, you would think already, if you look at this picture, for instance, that, that if, you, if, you, if you're sampling in the direction of the optimal control, and this is a solution which is very good, uh, quite good, your samples will be very good. You have, you'll, you have many surviving samples. And so there is sort of an uh, alignment of two objectives. One is to compute the optimal control, which is to minimize the control cost. And the other way is to actually, in order to compute it, you need to sample and you want to optimize the sampler. And to optimize the sampler, you also need a control. And the uh, control that you use for the sampling uh, is, is, is better uh, in, in terms of effective sample size. And now it turns out that these things actually go hand in hand. And we can show a theorem that shows that, the, uh, that if you have a better controller in, the, in, terms of, uh, in terms of optimal control, in the sense that it, it minimizes the control cost, that that controller is also better in the terms of uh, sampling. So it's a better important sampling in the sense of uh, the variance, in, in the sense of the effective sample size. So, um, so the picture is you start with a lousy controller because you don't know anything, maybe you control zero, you get some samples, from that you are able to construct uh, some sort of a controller, and with the controller, you can now sample again and get better estimates, better particles, better statistics, and you can compute a better controller. And with a better controller, you can again generate samples, and with these samples, you can you get a more refined uh, set of samples, and you can, can generate a better controller, etc. And, and so if you, you can also show that if you sample with the, uh, with the optimal controller, that if you have already in advance the optimal control solution, then, uh, then, in fact, that is also uh, optimal in the sense of, uh, of uh, uh, sampling. So, and, and what comes out is that, so if you look here at the formula, so if I sample from an uh, intermediate uh, distribution of the trajectories, then I have to multiply this cost that I get with this, with this uh, important sampling uh, ratio, right, that I had before also. Uh, that I had here uh, this, this important sampling ratio that you sample from the wrong distribution to, correspond, to, to correct for that. Now, this, this ratio can be in, in, in included into this exponent by changing S to SU, and if you do that, it actually uh, it becomes SU becomes S plus these two U-dependent terms. And so this is then the general uh, formula for the, for the cost that you use for discounting. If you sample with control zero, you just get the S. But if you sample with a control which is non-zero, you get this additional term uh, here. And now the, the miracle is that you see that the, uh, that the samples uh, are weighted 
with e to the minus uh, su, and so they are weighted with these terms, and we just have understood that if we have the optimal uh, control solution, if we sample from the optimal control solution, we get actually that the variance of the weights is zero. What does that mean? That means that these numbers uh, ha are always the same. They have no variance. They're always the same. Now these numbers are e to the minus s. So that means that s u, for every trajectory that I take, is going to give the same number. Now that's miraculous. So this number, s, if, if this is a stochastic quantity, right, there is noise here, there is noise in the x, there is noise all over the place, but if and only if I replace this, this, this function u, which is my optimal, uh, by the optimal control solution, then miraculously all noise cancels and whatever trajectory I put in here, I always get the same number, right? So that becomes a deterministic function. It's a very, very curious uh, fact, if and only if for the optimal control. So this is... So this is, the, this is the notion of the important sampling. And you'll find more in this paper. Uh, we're getting a little bit, we're out of time, right? This is, uh, are we out of time? Huh? I still have 15 minutes. Okay, do you still have 15 minutes? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so here's the, um, uh, so here's also a proof of this, uh, of this, uh, of that is that is s becomes uh, deterministic. So here you can. This is a very easy one-line proof. So it's just curious. So so remember that we can write the control cost. We can write it as an expected cost plus this uh, plus this log likelihood, this KL term, right? And so this can also uh, be written as the expectation of uh, s u. Remember because uh, s u was uh, this extra term is the log of p over q of q over p. In added in here, so we can also add it uh, here. Uh, so it's expected for US. So now we can uh, write that the optimal uh, cost to go is, uh, is the minus log of psi, which was this term that we had uh, here at the beginning, uh, and on, the, on uh, uh, optimal control. And we can also now uh, replace this Q by P times uh, Q over P. And so then we can put the Q of a P, we can put it in an exponent, we can write it as this, so this is just the same thing. And here we recognize that this is uh, uh, minus SU here. Uh, and now we can uh, use Jensen inequality. We can say that uh, the log of the expectation is, is less than the expectation of the log. So we can interchange these, so we get the, the sum over tall, P of tall, and then we get the uh, the log of the exponent, so we get just uh, this, uh, this, this term here, right? And this one we we, is just uh, this term, this C of P. So in all, I've done nothing else than saying that the optimal cost is less than any cost, right? So this is not a very deep, uh, not a very deep statement. But you see that you have here this Jensen bound in, in, in between, and you see that this, uh, that this Jensen bound gets, gets tight, that the inequality becomes an equality only if this quantity becomes noiseless, right? Because if this quantity becomes noiseless, doesn't vary, then you can take it out of the expectation value, if and only then. And so that's why if this becomes noiseless, you get a, that this bound becomes tight, and that means that you have your P is actually the optimal control. And that is, the, that is a very uh, brief way of seeing that if P is equal to the optimal control, optimal the, the trajectory, the distribution over optimal control trajectories, that in that case, the, uh, the, the variance in, in SU is actually zero. Right? That's, that follows from this, this proof. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so I told you that, that if you have a better controller, you can sample better. But now, of course, we need to, uh, we need to find uh, a better controller, uh, and we have to parameterize that, some, so learn that somehow. And so this is uh, what we can do. So here we have uh, our... Uh, estimation problem, and uh, we know that the optimal, uh, optimal sampler, the, optimal, the import, optimal important sampler is this uh, optimal control distribution, so this is, right, it, it's the argument and then renormalized, right, and the, the normalization constant is intractable, this is the same what I showed, showed before for this very simple Gaussian example. So, um, this, uh, so now we would, would like to sample, uh, have this, but we're now going to, what we're going to do, we're going to approximate 
this, this, uh, this optimal distribution by a parameterized distribution, which is parameterized by a controller, right, because it's a, it's a distribution over trajectories, and these trajectories are generated by a controller. And now, in addition, this controller is going to be parameterized by some parameters, because, you know, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, completely specify this controller, so we have this situation. And so now, one way you can do this is the so-called cross-entropy method, where you minimize the KL divergence between P star, which is what you want, and P of U that you, uh, that you have. And uh, this is uh, the result. So this is, looks very strange, because you would think, well, I don't know P star, so how can I ever minimize this distance? Uh, but actually, it turns out that you can compute uh, the gradient uh, quite, uh, quite well. Um, and uh, so the gradient uh, of, of this uh, is given by an expectation value over trajectories under your current control, weighted by e to the minus su, of something integrated over the time of your noise times the gradient of this thing. So it's a, some sort of a complex, uh, complex term. term. Uh, and so these, are, uh, these gradients can now be estimated uh, by, by, by sampling, and then we can uh, change the parameters to learn a better and better sampler, and at the same time, we're learning a better and better control solution. So we're doing both at the same, uh, at the same time. So this is something that can be very, very easily uh, uh, parallelized uh, uh, in the following way. So suppose that I uh, have a number of uh, iterations. I, I generate, uh, I have a certain controller, I, uh, I have a certain model, and I generate uh, data, which are trajectories uh, over, over, over the finite horizon time. And so this is my important uh, sampler that I do. I do this sampler. And then with the sample data, I learn a new controller, which is basically the gradient descent, which is this uh, step, right? I do, do this uh, gradient uh, update. And then I get a better uh, controller. And with the new controller, I can generate data again. I can do this step. But the interesting thing here is, is that you can very much parallelize this, because uh, the data generation, of course, this is uh, generating 100 samples. You can make 10 machines, each machine generating uh, 10 samples, right? So you can parallelize the data generation. So that's this MCMC boxes. They work completely parallel to each other. And then you can do the gradient computation. The gradient computation is also involving a expectation, so a sum over samples. So you can also, the gradient is also, can like the mini batches, like the, you know, the 100 samples are 10 mini batches, and each mini batch can be, the gradient can be computed for that particular mini batch, right? And so we can also parallelize from this data, we can compute their, their contribution to the gradients, and so this can also be parallelized. And so then you can uh, add these gradients, and you get a, a new uh, total gradient, which you're going to feed back, and then you're going to get a, you're going to update all the controllers. They're going to generate new data again, and they're going to generate new new uh, samples again. So this you can highly uh, highly parallelize and highly uh, optimize. So we apply this uh, first to some uh, some uh, simple problems. Uh, this is uh, this is just to uh, to give you an idea. So this is an inverted pendulum. Uh, where, where we have uh, something that has to swing up with a cost which is uh, essentially uh, 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 to, to be on top. And so here you see the effective sample size going uh, on the scale of 0 to 1, which is the maximum, uh, going starting basically at a effective sample size 0. So it's the quality of the samples that you generate gets, gets very, quite high uh, at some point. Here you see the cost uh, going down. And here you see then uh, a 2D rendering of the solution where here is... Uh, 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 here is velocity, and here is a position between 0 and 2 pi, and here is the initial position where you start, uh, top uh, everything down, and then uh, you swing up to this, uh, this top position. This is a controller that you, that you learn for this position. Here's another example of uh, Acrobot, which is a second order uh, two degree of freedom uh, a robot, which, uh, which you see here. We also, also learned here uh, is this. Uh, this system, so you see that it uh, this, this works uh, quite after learning. It's quite oh, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and uh, here's some details. So uh, you see that the well, I'm not going to go into details. We're getting out of time. So let me try to round up, and then we have time for some questions. <laughs> so I think this. Um, um, this, this whole kind of work can be used in the context of, uh, of integrating uh, sensory motor control. So, so, uh, so you could think of, uh, so suppose that you have some sort of a loop where you initialize with an initial control, and then for each time you act in the, in the world with your controller, 
you, you get some data, uh, and with that data from the outside world, with that data and your current uh, controller, then you can define a model, and a model in this case is function f, say, or a function g, in your dynamical system, right? You can, can make estimates of these, of these models, uh, and then with these models, you can then uh, uh, compute uh, optimal control uh, in, in, that, in, that, in that world. And this optimal control computation itself is again falls out into uh, a, another data generation, which is the sampling data that you generate to generate your trajectories in the path integral. Uh, so this is the Monte Carlo sampling. And then you can update your, uh, your, your, your controller by the parameter estimation, as I saw with this change in this theta variable, uh, this theta parameter. And, and, oh, I didn't tell you. So this can be, of course, this framework of, uh, of using uh, these networks here. Uh, there is no particular uh, model assumption here. So you can use any, you can use very simple networks. Like in this case, you use just a grid. Uh, but you can also use a deep neural network. And uh, so in principle, so since these deep neural networks are very, very flexible, and in principle, since you can generate an infinite amount of data, there is actually no obstruction to get close and close as possible to the optimal controller, uh, right? Because you, have, you are in the, in the happy situation that if you don't have data enough, you gener just generate more data. And if your model is not strong enough, you just uh, make a more stronger model. But of course, there is a, there is a catch with a, the with a bootstrapping that initially you have a very lousy controller, and so you're going to get very lousy data. And with very lousy data, you cannot really learn a very refined model. So we, initially, you can only learn very, maybe very simple models. So you have to sort of cascade your model, uh, your model complexity that you first learn a simple model, then learn a complexer model, and in this way, uh, bootstrap that situation. Anyway, so... Um, what I wanted to say, to come back to the beginning of uh, yesterday, is that uh, there's two types of data, right? So there's data that you, that you get from your acting in the world, and in this, in this view, you also have data that you get from, uh, uh, from generating out of your own model. And that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, so these are these two realities of the brain that I was talking about yesterday. Uh, so the first data is the ones, the sensory data that you, that you process by your Bayesian uh, viewpoint, and the second set of data that you generate in your Monte Carlo, in your important sampling, is uh, the one that you generate to compute your uh, optimal control. So that was the uh, idea. And that is all I wanted to say, and thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you.